So a lot of people are talking about these red heifers down in Texas that are being prepared to offer as sacrifices in Jerusalem. There's a temple that they say will be rebuilt in Jerusalem and these sacrifices are necessary to consecrate the temple. Is this what the Bible says must really happen before Jesus comes? Let's take a look in our Bibles. Let me share with you what Numbers 19 verses 1 and 2 tell us. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak ye to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. And you shall give her to Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth outside the camp, and one shall slay her before his face." These things were done in the special offerings in the temple back in the ancient days of Israel. Is God trying to bring these sacrifices back? Let's take a look at what the Bible says. Many today are looking for the rebuilding of the temple because we expect that Antichrist will come soon, and we know that Antichrist must stand up in the midst of the temple of God. So, what does this look like in Scripture? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here the Bible says that the coming of the Lord Jesus will not happen until first that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And this son of perdition puts himself up in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, does that mean that there must be a rebuilt temple in the land of Israel? Does it also mean that the sacrifices must begin again in the land of Israel? Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2 to see what the Bible says about this very matter. Ephesians 2 says this about the experience of God's people who belong to Christ. Let's read. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that you, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God, in the world. Here the Bible speaks about the Gentiles and the Jews, and it tells us that the Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world. They were strangers to the covenants of Israel. But the Lord tells us that God wants us to be partakers of these covenants, especially the new covenant, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 13 continues saying, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition. Now what is the Apostle Paul talking about here? He says that God is made of both peoples, Jews and Gentiles, circumcised and uncircumcised. He is made of both one new man that he has brought together and united the Jews and Gentiles in the faith of Jesus Christ. The middle wall of partition has been broken down, the Bible says. Verse 15 continues, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. So the Bible says that Jesus in the flesh as a human being broke down this wall of partition between us. He abolished a law of commandments in ordinances. Certain ordinances of the Old Testament were abolished at the cross, the Bible makes clear in this verse. This allowed him to make in himself of the two peoples one new man, one new nation. Notice verse 16. 
and that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The Bible says here that both Jew and Gentile are to be reconciled in one body by the cross of Jesus. We are united, Jew and Gentile, in the faith of Jesus Christ and through him being crucified on the cross of Calvary. Verse 17, And came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them that were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Remember that in the temple the Shekinah glory of God was dwelling. This was the purpose of the temple. God said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now the Bible tells us clearly here in the New Testament that there is a holy temple, and we, the people of God, made up of Jew and Gentile, are this holy temple, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets being the foundation of this holy temple in the Lord. The holy temple being mentioned here is a spiritual temple or house where the Holy Spirit will dwell. God's holy presence will dwell in the midst of his people in our hearts and in our minds. This is the holy temple that the New Testament tells us we are. So when the Bible says the Antichrist must rise up in the midst of the temple of God, it's not talking about a temple over in Jerusalem. It's talking about the Antichrist rising up in the midst of God's own holy people and proclaiming himself to be God instead of the living God and the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst. This is putting man above the divine God. Now, the Bible says that both Jew and Gentile are united in the cross of Jesus, that Jesus is our great sacrifice. So how could God approve of some more sacrifices and a temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem? Notice what Hebrews chapter 10 tells us in verse 1 and following. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body have you prepared me. In burnt offerings and in sacrifices for sin you have had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, you would not, neither have pleasure therein which are offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all, whether Jew or Gentile, Jesus Christ was offered as our great sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of our hope and all of our salvation are built upon Jesus Christ alone. God will not honor any wicked sacrifices that deny Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior of us all. The Bible says that Jesus was offered once for all. There is no more need of any other sacrifices. The Bible says that Jesus took away that first covenant, that he may establish the second, and it is in his blood alone. Whether Jew or Gentile, we are saved by the blood of Christ, by the sacrifice of Jesus, and God wants to dwell in us, his holy people, as his holy temple. He is not going to sanctify any wicked denial of faith and denial of Jesus Christ over in the Holy Land. The Bible says here in verse 11 and 12, 
and every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Jesus Christ offered once for all of us, and those sacrifices can never take away sins. They were simply a shadow pointing forward to the great sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Anyone who denies this is denying God and his plan and his new covenant. And whether Jew or Gentile, they will be lost if they deny the power of Jesus and the cross. Verse 13, From hereafter expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now some of you might be wondering, what about the prophecy of the 70 weeks? What about the seven years that the Bible talks about? Let's go and take a look at exactly that verse. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was given a vision in the first year of Darius the Mede. This was around 539 BC when the Medes and Persians had just taken over Babylon. Daniel was a captive there in ancient Babylon and the Jews had been captives for about 70 years at this point. Jerusalem was broken down and the temple was broken down back in Israel. And Daniel was praying in this chapter that God would restore his people and his city and would rebuild the temple over in Jerusalem. So, as he was praying, the angel Gabriel came to him and gave him this particular vision. And we want to look at the details of this vision in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. This is how the Bible reads. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now we're going to see in just a minute that this prophecy speaks very clearly about the Messiah, the anointed one. Notice also in verse 24 that where it says he will make an end of sins, this could also be understood as making an end of sin offerings or sacrifices. Notice as well that reconciliation is made for iniquity. That is, we are reconciled because we have sinned. We are brought to God and forgiven for our sins. And it says that everlasting righteousness will be brought in. Now, the Bible tells us that we are saved by the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, and not our own. It is his righteousness that is everlasting, and no one else's righteousness is everlasting, only his. Now, let's take a look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the Bible tells us about a command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And from this command will stretch 69 weeks, 69 prophetic weeks until the Messiah, the Anointed One, shows up. Now, there are several decrees or commands between the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that give us some kind of dates regarding things happening in Jerusalem and rebuilding taking place over there. But there is one of those decrees that especially fits this particular prophecy, and that is the one that is found in Ezra chapter 7. We find in verse 7 that this was the seventh year of King Artaxerxes of Persia. That was the year 457 BC. Now, if we take this time period of 483 years, that is 69 prophetic weeks, these are weeks of years, each day is representing a year. So we have 483 years stretching from 457, then we will end up in the year 27 AD. Now, if you're doing this on your calculator, you'll probably get 26 because the calculator uses a zero digit between negative one and one. So if you get 26 on your calculator, just know that you need to add one more number, which will give you 27. 27 AD is when we should expect the Messiah to show up. And if we were to go into the book of Luke, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it tells us that in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, John the Baptist was baptizing in the wilderness, and Jesus came also and was baptized, and the Holy Spirit anointed him at his baptism. His public ministry began from that point of his anointing by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. This was the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of Messiah. 
And can you guess which year is that? The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, that is 27 AD. So an exact fit of the prophetic timeline from the decree given in Ezra 7, 7 and following to the time when Jesus was anointed as Messiah. An exact fit of 483 years, 69 prophetic weeks from the decree to restore and rebuild to the coming of Messiah, the anointed one. God is exact in his prophecies. Verse 26 reads, And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And to the end of the war desolations are determined. So here the Bible tells us that after those 69 weeks and Messiah's coming, then he will be cut off. Now the verse here read 62 weeks when in fact it is referring to the entire period of 69 weeks leading up to the arrival of Messiah. The Bible has simply broken it into sections here. It talked about seven weeks and then 62 weeks. And so after those 62 weeks plus the seven that preceded the 62, we have 69. So Messiah shows up in AD 27 and the Bible says that he will be cut off, but not for himself. Hmm. Who was he cut off for? Well, Isaiah 53, 8 tells us that the suffering servant of God, the Messiah, would be cut off, not for himself, but for our sins. So this is the work of Jesus, that he would be cut off, he would die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And this was described right here, that Jesus is the great sacrifice, he is the great offering, and he died there for you and for me, that we might be saved by his blood, by his great sacrifice alone. The Bible also tells us here that the city and the sanctuary of Jerusalem would be destroyed shortly after this great event. And if we look at history in AD 70, the temple was destroyed by the Roman armies under General Titus. The temple and the city were destroyed in 70 AD, just as Jesus had prophesied and just as Daniel had prophesied right here. They have remained destroyed even to this very day. Now let's read verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Many people say this verse is referring to Antichrist, that somehow Antichrist is going to come and confirm a covenant with many for, for one week or seven years, and that there will be the rebuilding of the temple and sacrifices and offerings, and then putting an end to sacrifices and offerings. But if you look at this prophecy, you will see that this really just cannot be, because people are floating the last week of the prophecy way down at the end of time. They're not following the time prophecy from 457 all the way up to 27 AD and then following the steps of the process of the time prophecy. What covenant was to be confirmed? Many will say this is some peace treaty by the Antichrist, but that is not what the Bible says here. It's talking about the covenant. And when you read what the Bible says in Daniel 11 verses 28 through 30, it tells us about the holy covenant that Messiah confirms, that Messiah makes with his people. Jesus confirmed this covenant in his blood, the new covenant, that he replaces all sacrifice and all offering with his one body and his one sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. This is, in fact, what the Bible is talking about here. It's not speaking about the working of Antichrist. It's speaking about the main subject of this prophecy, which is the Messiah and the work of Messiah. So the Bible tells us that for three and a half years of the last seven, Messiah would be confirming a covenant with his people. For three and a half years, he would confirm it, and then he would be cut off in the midst of the week, and he would cause sacrifice and oblation to cease, or offering to cease, because he is the one great offering. At the cross of Calvary, all of that ceases. The Bible is so clear throughout New and Old Testaments that Messiah would end these sacrifices and offerings. And for the remaining three and a half years, the disciples of Jesus were to confirm the gospel covenant with the Jews before they would take this message out to the Gentiles. This is exactly what the Bible was prophesying and exactly what has happened in history. 
Jesus told his disciples, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were focusing on confirming the gospel covenant with Israel before they would take it to the rest of the world. And today, both Jew and Gentile are made one in Christ Jesus by his one offering upon the cross of Calvary. So anyone who tries to restart sacrifices and offerings over in the Holy Land and to rebuild some temple over there is in fact denying the cross of Jesus Christ and following false teachings and false prophetic revelations, which are not what the Bible says here at all. Let's put our faith in Jesus and quit trying to go back to the old types rather than the very genuine article himself, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The shadowy types are passed away at the cross of Jesus. Will you put your faith in Jesus today? Please give this video a like if you enjoyed it and share it with a friend. You can check out an additional video you might like right here. And I hope you'll have a wonderful and blessed day in Christ Jesus. God bless you, my friend, and I'll see you in the next one.